Or am I just here for entertainment? The end of light. friends, welcome back to the shop for another episode. If this is your first time here, I'm Dana. I'm Art. And today we're tackling a very major project on Harold, our uh, 72 Chevy truck. And uh, it's something I hate. Electrical. That's right. We are jumping into something that Dana is not excited about, but thankfully she's here to help. <laughs> so, this is something that is an absolute must on this truck because either we are missing wires completely or the wires are brittle, have been soldered into too many times and are just not going where they're supposed to go. And we're going with the American hot wire kit. I mean, auto wire kit. So this is model number 510089. And what this will allow us to do is completely maintain and upgrade Harold's electricals to meet our needs. And there's something I really like about this kit. It comes with wonderful, amazing instructions, especially the part where it gives you the complete wiring diagram in color. Furthermore, everything is pre-wrapped in bags telling you exactly what components goes where and what it's for. So this would be our dash kit, hence the wonderful fun I get to do of ripping out the entire dash. We also have separated components such as the rear body kit, alternator and main power. Everything in here is just completely individually wrapped with specific instructions for each set of the wiring diagram components. Well, our plan for this uh, rewire of Project Carol is really just kind of uh, multifaceted. It's going to be a straight through video. If we find something that's special that we want to call out, We'll stop our filming and go ahead and point it out to you right then and there. But for the most part, it's gonna be ripping out the dash, ripping out the wires, and then running all of these new components. Specifically, Art running the new components and wires. Now what we have here is a very special museum piece. The actual original use for duct tape. Nice. Yeah, it's getting replaced. So we dropped down the heater core and found a little present on the inside. Just a hint of a wasp nest. Probably don't want that coming at you when you turn the heater on. We've also decided that since the HVAC system does not function very well. Uh, well, actually not at all. We're gonna go ahead and remove it while we're back in here. In order to remove the instrument cluster, the first thing you've gotta do is pull off all the knobs and bezels for our lights, our washers, and our throttle. So 
Pulling off the bezel for the wiper washer was really easy. There's a little screw holding it on. The throttle came out on its own, which is probably a bad thing, but we will sort that out. The lights, however, have no screw holding the knob in place. And if you just pull on it, obviously it's got a stopper. So the way that you pull this off is feel back around behind the instrument cluster and you'll feel a little button on top of the switch. Press down on the button and the knob pulls right out. I said, and the knob pulls right out. I got it before. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Press the button and pull. <laughs> to remove the actual bezel, you need some needle nose pliers. Put in the two little holes here and turn it counterclockwise. Don't drop it. No. Once you get your knobs and the actual bezels taken off from the radio, there is a 5 16th nut here that you actually will end up needing to take off in order to remove the radio. Fifty pound radio right here. <laughs> Turn the radio on. Good lord. The massive <laughs> heat sinks on this bad boy. <laughs> Oh, this thing is no joke for weight. Does it just take you back? Yes, to when I was born. Those good old days. <laughs> Here, we have 1972 circa high definition audio system right here. Look at that. Man. They look pretty pretty bad they're pretty bad and not hooked up probably a good reason for that but wow can you imagine the sound out of these bad boys no <laughs> definitely before my time <laughs> oh man that's cool so in order for us to get the gauge cluster out we actually had to drop our steering wheel which works in our favor because now we can get to that screw for the dash pad as well It's very dirty. That one has to come out, and then we gotta pull up. Good. Well, while we have everything torn apart, why not replace the pieces that are busted? And all the electrical stuff is a perfect time because this is a bitch to get out. <laughs> Woo! Woo! Nice and pretty and new. You have to do everything by feel sometimes. Making some pretty good progress. I think we're just a few wires short of having everything out. We did decide to go ahead and take out the full HVAC system. It's old, it's rusty, it's uh, rat just infested. Rat infested. Check out the nasty nests and everything inside of what we pulled out. Yeah.
button and we don't need it. So when we're ready for that point of uh, putting a new system in, we'll just go with the vintage air, a lot smoother, smoother, yeah, smoother. What you got there? The brains! <laughs> All right, starting with bag G. Let's get into this. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you know that I am a neat freak when it comes to wiring and organization. So before this even goes in, it's easier just to tape all of these individual wire groups up. So I took some Tessa tape, tape them all up. The good thing is, is that each of these plugs are already pictured on the instructions and plus every little bit on the wiring shows exactly what it goes to in case the pictures don't line up. So now it's time to go ahead and mount this fuse block and start the rest of the big work. Okay, we have reached the first of which I hope to be very, very few modifications to the vehicle itself. We actually have to open up the hole in the firewall a little bit bigger for the new fuse block. American Auto Wire does a really good job of actually giving you this template. So when you cut it out, you have just slightly enough the hole that needs to actually fit the new fuse block going through and the notation as to where the new screw holes need to go. All right, there's our original hole right there. And in this, we're gonna use the sticky side to mark this on the inside to go ahead and open this up just a tad more. All right, let's get this done. Expanded hole is done. Uh, I'll give you a little tip when you're cutting wheels, which I was using a Dremel tool, just will not cut the corners well enough. Use one of these little tips if you have one. Amazing for that little thin metal and making sure your curves are pretty damn straight. New fuse block is in. We'll come back later on after everything is completed and actually cut off the ends of these sharp screws. Now I'm not particularly focused on trying to get everything connected initially because I just want to get things hooked up either that are easy and right in front of us or required to start. So we've got the floor dimmer switch, the brake switch, the neutral safety switch, cigarette lighter, ignition switch all connected. All the heater and AC stuff is irrelevant at this point and some of the other things are not going to be needed to start as well. So we're moving on to package J, which is for the engine kit. Bulkhead connector is in. So that's both the motor side as well as the light side. And looking at these, plug and play time is now over boys and girls. It's now time for stripping and crimping and soldering and plugging in the meat and potatoes of it all. all right, we've ran and connected our purple to the starter solenoid. And since we've upgraded our alternator to higher output as well as a one wire, we end up having to use their mega fuse kit to change the wiring around. 
And I think I'm actually going to mount it right here on the firewall. Fits perfectly. They don't really have a location that they recommend, but I think this will be a really clean spot. We've got to run this power wire directly into here, then run from here over to the alternator, and then also another one running to the starter. So this should keep the wires uh, fairly clean. All right, update on where we are at. We've got our power wire going to the alternator, power wire going to the starter. We've got the ignition running over. This blue wire is actually an oil pressure switch line or oil pressure light line. Ours actually is a mechanical one that has a hard line running directly to the oil pressure gauge. So we'll actually be depinning this from the bulkhead since it's not going to be used. To walk through the other wires that we've got hooked up so far, dark green going to the temperature sensor there on the top of the intake. We have our pink and white. Pink goes to the battery side of the distributor. White goes to the tack side. Then we have tan running over to the hot side of the electric choke on the car. Everything else is pretty much connected. So next step is to go ahead and see if we can fire her up. A few moments later. Holy shit. Probably would have been good had I checked all the fuel line fittings to make sure they were all tight. <laughs> Oops, I did one. I love the smell of fuel in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try this again.
good to hear his voice again. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you've been following along on this, you know this is a huge step. It's been many months since Harold was down. New water pump, new carburetor, new harmonic balancer, <laughs> new alternator. Uh, fuel regulator. New fuel regulator. Um, Wow, we have done a lot <laughs> since he actually started up. So this was a big part, well, I'll say big part, but part one for the wiring. We just wanted to ensure that he started up. We got the understanding of the wiring done. And now that this piece is checked off, now we can go ahead and focus on the rest of the wiring, the cluster, the lights, the rear, everything else that's a part of this kit. So that is going to be part two in this series for wiring with Harold. But, whew. <laughs> although the, the couple of little boo-boos here and there uh, with the fuel lines is just thinking too far ahead in the steps and not going back and tracing some of those that I did earlier on replacing those fuel lines. Now, I forgot to call out the one reason why nothing happened on our first attempt to click over, the battery was just too drained. It had 10 volts, which I thought was going to be sufficient enough to be able to start it. But as soon as you turn on the ignition, he dropped all the way down below 7. And I was like, okay, this has got to be it. Because what you didn't see is we were tracing every damn wire. <laughs> trying to figure out did something just not get plugged in or did it come undone but we traced the power to the ignition the ignition showed 10 volts which was the same at the battery but then after going through everything else and just like okay this is the only thing i could think of turn the ignition check the voltage on the battery and it dropped so low where it would not do anything put it on the charger for 30 minutes and Damn! We got fire. We got fire! <laughs> so, so happy because I was about to say, I don't know, I give up. Uh, but hope you enjoyed this episode and hope you continue to follow along on Project Herald as well as everything else on the channel. But let us know your thoughts, especially if you're tackling this project like we are. But until then, we hope you take care, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.